housing issues that affect the general public, serving the interests of homeowners, property owners, and investors. He serves as the national president of the Asian Real Estate Association of America, AREA, and he also serves the board of directors and the Massachusetts Association of Realtors, MAR, and the Greater Boston Association of Realtors. In addition, he serves on the Finance Committee and the Government Affairs Committee for the Mass Association of Realtors. Tom, thank, thank you very you. much. Well, good morning, everybody. Antoine, that was amazing. Thank you. A lot of the statistics that Antoine shared um, really uh, parallel those statistics for our friends at the Hispanic Real Estate Professional uh, Association as well as the Asian Real Estate Association of America. Right? And it's very easy, it's very distinctive when the other person on the line has a Vietnamese accent. And the first thing they say is, do you speak Vietnamese? And of course I answer in Vietnamese, yes I do. And I said, how can I help you? I said, you're a realtor. I said, yes I am. Um, can you please get me into this house? I want to go see it. I'm like, sure, Wait, where? And more times than not, it is two hours, three hours away from where I am, in Springfield, in the most northern part of the state of, of, of Massachusetts, because uh, they've been trying to get into the house, and no one would show them the house because they have a broken accent, a very deep accent, and the house is only $40,000 or $60,000, and as real estate professionals, those real estate professionals in those markets would not open up the door. That is true and real, ladies and gentlemen. And we can all make a, a, a difference, right? I share that story with my friends at the Massachusetts Association, Association of Realtors. And, you know, Paul Yorkis, our uh, the, uh, president a couple of years ago, he came up to me, tears in his eyes, and he goes, Tom, if that ever happens, you call me, and I would drive three hours to get that done, right? You can do that too. All right. Um, the statistics that I'm going to share with you is right on our webpage. I'm going to share with you just about 10 minutes of statistics. It's very important because it talks about home ownership and increasing the level of home ownership for all Americans, specifically for me, for the AEI community. You get this report uh, when, you become, when you become a member of ARIA. All right. And uh, it's right online. We do it every year. And it's a very sought after report. It's a State of Asia America report. In it, you will find that the AAPI community are buying homes and investing in real estate like never before. It is the fastest growing population, AAPI is the fastest growing minority population here in the United States. Okay. Um, the API community here is the 17th largest economy in the world. In 2018, we exceeded $1 trillion of purchasing power. What does that mean? That means that the audience, you and I, can learn to work with the API community to serve the 17th largest economy, one behind Mexico, the entire country, the entire GDP of Mexico, and one above Turkey. The buying power is right here, okay? Um, and by 2055, just 35 short years from now, the AAPI community will be the largest minority group in the land. Now get this statistics. When you add the AAPI community together with the blacks and the Hispanics, by then will be the largest group and then the non-Hispanic whites will be then the minority. So this land is changing and it's changing rapidly, right? Um, the AAPI community are family focused. You wanna to learn to work with the API because we have multi-generationals who, who live in the home sometimes and our apartments are pretty popular. Right, uh, uh, units that have multi, multi generations are very popular. So learn to work with us so that you can provide them the, the right home, find them the right property uh, to, to raise the family in. The API is high or highly educated. Okay, in the study you'll find that um, uh, the um, rate of AAPIs who go on to college 
is extremely high. Okay, 52% of the APIs who graduate from high school go on to college compared to the national average, just 30% 30% who finish a college education. Okay, um, there are 26 million uh, AAPI today, and that accounts for about 8% of the U.S. population. The U.S. population is about 325 million, so 8%. And in pockets of America, the AAPI community uh, rank extremely high. Okay, and in other pockets, it, it ranks extremely low. So this report will give you an idea of um, uh, of where the population is migrating to and from. Okay, um, our community speaks over 50 different languages, not just Vietnamese and Chinese and Filipino and Korean, but over 50 of them. And so within our community, there's also a lot of diversity. Okay, and that's part of the organization's mission is to educate um, the, the, the general public as well as our own community about the different ethnicities within it. Okay, um, did you know that 59% of the 20 Six million AAPI are foreign born. Okay, um, you think that the immigration that we hear in the news all the time is coming from Mexico? Untrue, it's coming from Asia. The Asians are coming here to the US faster in larger, and in larger numbers than they are coming in from Mexico. So it is a population you definitely want to, uh, to learn to work with. Um, the national average of Americans who go on to complete advanced degrees are 10%. With the API, we totally are off the charts. We're at 21% with master's degrees. I'm one of eight kids, eight immigrant kids, and I'm ashamed to say I did not get a master's degree. The rest of my brothers and sisters did. <laughs> I went to sell houses, and I love it. <laughs> okay. The national, ab national income across our land is 53000 Okay, for the API, that's 73,000. So we uh, outrank uh, uh, salaries by 39% or more. Here's the thing. Despite high levels of education, despite higher levels of income, the API community lag behind in home ownership rate. Our friends Antoine shared with you that the blacks have a 46% rate of home ownership compared to the non-Hispanic whites at 72, the Asian Americans are 58% compared to 72%. So there's still this 14% gap of home ownership rate for the AAPI community. Why? Well, that's the mission of ARIO is to try to figure out and try to educate not just only our community, but the community at large about why, right? Um, the, um, here in the Northeast, 20% um, of the API co uh, community across the land live here in the Northeast, so a very large population of uh, APIs live here, and it continues to grow uh, here in Connecticut, in New York, in Boston, Maine, New Hampshire. Okay? Um, in, from 2000 to 2010, the API community here in no the Northeast grew by 45%. Forty-five percent. This is what our studies are showing us. And in the last five, excuse me, between 2010 to 2015, that grew by 26 percent. Okay, so the APAC community is growing massively. Why? Great education, amazing jobs, okay, and we'll be becoming more culturally diverse here in the Northeast as well, okay? Very cool statistic, which we just got this uh, breaking news this year, is 25% of the 20% here in the API community in the New England in the Northeast are below 18 years old. 25%. All right, and so, boy, is it, is it smart for us as real estate professionals to learn how to work with this community? Okay, because those kids are going to go on to college, they're going to have great jobs, and they're going to be buying homes in about five to ten years. Okay, um, the median household income um, here in the Northeast, um, the, the general population is about $95,000. For the AAPI community, that's $109,000, 15% higher. Yet, the rate of home ownership is still lagging behind at an average of 14%. Okay. So why all these statistics? Because 
As the world gets smaller and more diverse, it's in all of our best interest to learn to work with each other, to learn so that uh, to learn of each other, so that we can better serve each other. Yes. Okay. And so, please dive into some of these reports that we have for you, and then truly join the organization so you can get around us. We 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 want to nothing more than to educate the general public about how to do business with us. Okay. Home ownership and property rights. I said it earlier. Is the equalizer for building wealth, okay, and, and to build generational wealth. Um, one of the things that um, I'd like to ask of you is to, um, you know, reach out to other organizations and, and, and join other organizations, okay. I'm a member of NAREB, I'm a member of NAREB, I'm a member of the Women's Council. I'm of, of course a, a realtor organization, right? I'm a member of the Asian Real Estate Association. And I become members of these organizations, so I seek first to understand, then you guys, then to be understood. Okay, so please try to diversify your, uh, yourself in, in, in your meetings, you get out there, get out of your comfort zone, and let's build one great America and build one great America together. Thank you very much, please. Yeah. I think we've got some time for some questions and answers, um, and so we'll bring our speakers back up. Um, Tom, thank you very much. That was very good. Doesn't matter. It should be okay. We'll move things around. There's another. Get the other speaker over there. Excuse me. Fine. Um, so, do we have any questions for our wonderful speakers here? Yes, Dave. Um, yeah, David Johnston. Um, I'm a lender, a local lender. I wanted to clarify something that you said, Antoine, about uh, loan level price adjustments or what they call overlays. Um, the overlays are towards credit scoring and loan to value. Uh, there are no overlays for any ethnicity or marital preference or anything like that. It's all tied to credit scoring, loan to value, and other parameters like that. So great point. So one of the things that we have found, and if you look in our state of housing and black America report, um, we believe that the overlaying of the points before the crisis, the, as you're probably aware, I'm not sure how many years you've been in the business, but- 28. 28, so then you're very aware that prior to uh, uh, the crisis, when they did the uh, um, um, risk pools, it was not by the individual, it was, but it was by a pool. And so when you start doing these overlays now in terms of risk-based pricing, which did not exist in terms of the way it's done now, and adding those, it was based on the pool, not based on the individual borrower. And when we find, when we have find, and we conduct it in our report, that people are being priced out of the market based on these additional uh, credit scoring criteria, whether it's the six, you know, the, the, the different brackets based on their credit scoring. And so we we believe that uh, we need to get out of that risk-based pricing because you can almost predict. Uh, we know what the average African American uh, credit score is. We know what the average White American credit score is, and then they start adding these additional overlays onto onto the loans based on their credit scoring models. We think the pooling should be based on a group of borrowers, not based on any, the, the fees should be based on a group of borrowers, not based on the individual person. You, you. So, so when you're saying about pooling, you're talking about what they call you know, in the old days, redlining, correct? Like, yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. And, and that, you know, that, that doesn't matter if you're a bank, or if you're a small local mortgage company, those restrictions, you know, the, those guidelines, those the, the redlining, uh, that's gone. That's, I mean, it, the, it's, it's unfortunately, um, unfortunately that um, to keep Sorry. reading. <laughs> so unfortunately, it's not going. I mean, we can document uh, um, how much the loan level price adjustments are. White borrowers, black borrowers. Um, so it may appear innocent, 
but disparate impact uh, doesn't mean you have to be intentional for that to be a bias when you put that policy in, in place. So we have been fighting uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, FHA, I mean FHFA, the Federal Housing Finance Agency that is driving this risk-based pricing thing. We're actually meeting with, uh, I'm flying back, at a, we're meeting with Mark Calabria tonight, and then we're meeting with him at his office on Friday because we're working aggressively to get away with loan level price adjustments. Uh, and so what I'm saying to you is that it does exist. We, we've documented, a lot of other groups have documented. It didn't exist prior uh, to uh, 2012, I think it was. And we need to get, get uh, 2014, we need to get rid of it. Thank you. Other questions? Ron's got one in the back, one up front here too. Or here, I, ha I have um, some concern when you talk about um, credit uh, scoring, so that you, uh, for blacks, so that you know they can. To me, it's so they can af afford it, and I think everybody should be treated equally. And if you um, You're vilifying the subprime and what happened happened there. You touched on the Community Reinvestment Act. That basically forced banks to come up with loans <coughs> that they would otherwise not give. And I think what you, what you're, I'm, I'm very concerned with, with some of the stuff in this report that the problems that got, um, will repeat themselves. We just came through a downturn in the yes from the subprime, uh, started it all. Uh, I was around when we had the one in the late 80s that ramped up the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, and I think what needs to be done is education. Personally, I, I found um, more credit issues with African-American clients than I have with Haitian clients, as an example. And what, what is your group doing to uh, improve uh, the fiscal education? The president, when this was written, you know, had, had the one line about fiscal responsibility, and I think that's very important, because not everybody should own a home. Everyone should have the opportunity and the ability, and they shouldn't be discriminated against, but they shouldn't own a home that they can't afford. I mean, I, I know uh, Mr. Trump is, is jumping at the bit as well. <laughs> let, me, let, me see. let me unpack a couple of these things. Uh, I think earlier I made it clear that we are for sustainable and affordable home ownership. Everyone, I think you're right on in terms of everyone should have a fair and equitable shot to home ownership. What I want you to think about is the false narrative about why the crisis was created. Okay. Um, did some African Americans get loans that they couldn't afford? Yes. But during the peak, before the peak of the crisis in 2004, where I showed you that number where it was the highest, most of those African Americans were in conventional and some were in FHA. But at that point in time, most of those borrowers were getting conventional mortgages that were not um, underwritten by uh, Danny and Fred. Okay? I want you also to know that when, we, when the crisis was created, um, most of the government bailout actually went to white property owners. Did you know that? Because most African, so when the, when the government provided financial assistance to the banks and then to borrowers, most African Americans did not have loans that were bailed out by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac could never 
provided more than 5% of their loans to minority groups as a combined group, especially African Americans. So that's fact number one. So we never got enough loans from Fannie and Freddie that were insured by them to break the system. You can't break a system when you're less than 5% of somebody's business, right? You can impact it, but you can't break it. Uh, secondly, it is well documented that you had African American borrowers who had good loans, who during 04 through 09 were bombarded with these toxic loan products to refinance, right? So you had first generation, a few second generation folks who got these refi products that were, it's been documented by emails, by court testimonies to get them to refinance the house. That some didn't even, even have a mortgage at that time. Some wanted a line of credit. Some were told to do cash outs and refis. And then those loans were securitized, which is something that people are worried about now. Uh, and that's how they, many people got into this situation. And um, we don't talk about that. We don't, we, you know, that narrative, that predatory, that targeting of doc, black doctors, black lawyers, uh, families that were impacted, we don't talk about that, because that's not sexy. It's easy to say, well, all these irresponsible borrowers got mortgages that they couldn't afford. We don't want to tell them that they were targeted and we purposely, we had people who had 670, 720 credit scores that were shop products that were bad. We don't talk about that. So what we do, uh, to your point, we, part of our effort to increase home ownership, um, we do community wealth building days across the country. And part of those community wealth building days to promote home ownership, we have an affiliate in our association called the National uh, Investment Division, which is NID, which is a national HUD approved housing counseling agency. It's been around for well over 25 years and it promotes housing counseling. So we, we promote that. The last thing I want to emphasize, and I'll go to Mr. Trump, is that it's well documented for lenders, and I don't remember this gentleman's name. Dave. It's well documented. Dave? Dave, yeah. Yeah. It's well documented as well for people in the lending community. There's so many people that are underbanked, and there's so many people, black, white, et cetera, but disproportionately African Americans that are are um, locked out of the credit box, right? Um, and so we have to address that issue. We're dealing with a credit modeling system that predates flip phones. So the credit criteria that we use to do mortgages today, is not rhetoric, this is reality. We have an outdated credit modeling system. If you have kids right now, I was with someone two days ago last week who, uh, Annie McCullough, who used to work for Fannie Mae. She has two kids, they're white. Her kids work. One, uh, one doesn't have a car, and two, and both of her kids are on her cell phone plan. Each of them only have one credit card, and they both have jobs, and they live in Washington, D.C. Based on the credit modeling we have, it would be hard for them to get a house. And that, that is a situation that is true today. And then when we talk about, you know, the fact that there's still biases in the lending process. Less than 5% of all loan uh, officers in the industry are people of color. So there's an effort by the Mortgage Bankers Association to try to change that because as all of us know those demographics are changing, but there are biases. And whether it's on the phone, whether it's on the phone with the lender, whether they look at your zip code, because you know, artificial intelligence. You don't have to, they don't have to, um, there are things in your profile that systems can predict who you are and not just what your credit is. Credit is only a part of your determination for when you get a loan. 
And with AI, a lot of us are concerned that it impacts the ability not only people to get a loan, but the type of loan that they get. Because we want people to get a loan, but we want them to get a quality loan. And we don't want people to overpay when they shouldn't have to overpay. And that's another issue as well. Thank you. Right, so nobody um, wants us to go back to the last great recession, nobody. All right, because the minority uh, uh, groups during 05 to 2010, let's say, took the hardest hit. So believe us when we say we definitely want to continue to do responsible lending. We want to make sure that uh, we promote sustainable and affordable homeownership for our communities, right? That we never stretch a homeowner to the point where, boy, if they uh, get laid off for three months, they lose the house because that's exactly what happened. Okay, so for ARIA, um, how do we close that home ownership gap? Uh, we, this year we're working on three policy points. I hit on one of them on this talk here. But the three policy points are alternative credit, what my friend Antoine just talked about, and I'll dive deeper into that. The second piece is language access reform. Okay, a lot of uh, Asian Americans um, um, speak, 72% of us speak a second language. So you, you, your parents, your grandparents, your aunts and uncles out there, right? Are you proud when, you, when your kids speak two languages, yes or no? Yes. Absolutely, right? Uh, and so if we, if we encourage a second language or a third language, yet when it comes to the home, uh, yet when it comes to mortgages, and let's say the older generation doesn't know how to read English, and we ask them to sign a mortgage document that's about yay thick, they shy away from signing the life away. That's one of the reasons why we need language access reform. Um, um, and then the diversity and inclusion. Okay, um, diversity and inclusion. Antoine just said, you know, among the Mortgage Bank Association, less than 5% are of minority. Well, how, are, how, how, how is that relation? Is there a um, relation, relational uh, connection there in terms of understanding the community? Right, and this, so this is disconnect um, there. So in terms of alternative credit, um, ARIA um, def wants to work with the FHFA. There's already a section that's already passed uh, uh, during the last um, um, uh, section 310 of the Senate Bill 2055 was an important first step where we encourage Congress to work with the federal housing finance agency to create legislation that mandates alternative credit methods to be introduced and accepted into the marketplace and the mortgage buying process. What does that mean? Um, the FICO scoring is totally outdated for the land today. Totally outdated, okay? And we live and die by the FICO scoring um, to either get a great mortgage product, meaning at a great rate, or if we don't have a great FICO score, we end up paying that $100,000 extra over the course of 30 years. Well, for the API community, you have to understand that we don't believe in credit. Back in the old homeland, right, if you have credit, that means you owe people money. That means you are a slave to them. And back in the old countries, banks weren't stable. So if you put your money in the bank, you might not see it back. Case in point, my family left April 30th, 1975. It was a week before we, um, it was a week before that my mom and dad got word that basically we're losing the country. I, left, I, I lived in South Vietnam and Saigon and the <coughs> North Vietnamese were coming in, the communists were coming in and uh, we're, 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 we're gonna lose this war. Right? The United States of America is going to pull out on April 30th, and three days before, she ran to the bank, and the banks were all shut down. As a matter of fact, weeks before, the banks were shut down. You couldn't get your money anymore. So all the money you had in the bank, kids said goodbye. So as a culture, we don't trust banks. We can't get the money out. And so we come here, we don't put money in the bank. We put it on a mattress, or we do something else. Right? We're cash rich. Credit thin, credit file thin. So that's part of the work that ARIA is doing to educate that, hey, you can't trust the banks here. All right? Um, so uh, imagine this. If you are working with 
consumers out there and they can afford to pay rent for three straight years and they have the rent payments, the, the, the checks are cash, it's all on time, okay? And then they can show you the utility bills and all utility bills are paid on time. And the cell phones are paid on time and the car payments, well not car, cars are being added to FICO. But all the other threes that I talked about, don't add, don't, don't, add, don't get added to FICO score. So as, as good as we are with those credits, even though we don't have a credit card, our FICO score never builds. If we pay our doctor's bills on time, our insurance bills on time, that doesn't get counted towards your FICO score. So what ARIA is working for is alternative credit where the agency start counting things like rent payments, medical payments, right, uh, t t tuition, um, all these other things that we use, and utility bills. And if I can prove that after I buy a home and my mortgage principal interest, taxes, insurance, everything else is less than what I, was, what I was paying before the past three years, shouldn't I be able to own a home? Yeah. Is that responsible lending? Yeah. 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 Do we have another question over there, Susie? We got a couple. So what I will do, which I, what I normally do when I do these presentations, is I will have my office, there's a, if someone could write this down, there is a, there's a website called LendingPatternsLight.com. LendingPatternsLight, L-I-T-E, dot com. And you can go on that website, you can put in any one of these towns, you put in the state, and it will provide you with um, basic information on lending trends for your community. So this will help you take, you know, because sometimes we, we like um, this young lady was just talking about, we think that, well, they're maybe, maybe not here, maybe it's not there, but I can just friendly say to you that based on the reports, and I get reports every single day, every day. There's always someone getting in trouble for not doing the right thing. You may just not see it in your newspaper, um, but I, I would I would humbly suggest, really state that there are probably few places in this state 
where there's an equity in the approval, there's equality and equity in approval rates for loans and mortgages. I'm certain there's a disparity because it would have been written about. Because the, one of the areas in the country that actually was number one last year, it was like some small town in um, Texas. And actually in the Northeast has been a bigger challenge in terms of many disparities than actually some parts of the South. In the, the areas where the black ownership rate is increasing the fastest, it's actually in the antebellum South. Did y'all know that? So I just, you know, sometimes, you know, I'm a, I'm a Buffalo guy, very progressive, you know, but I, I, I just give you the facts, just the facts. Richard, I maybe have one last question for you. Um, so this is great, we do this maybe once a year and it kind of brings all this to light. What can we do to kind of continuing education for ourselves, kind of a practice? Because a lot of us potentially don't see the discrimination. So what do we do to make sure we're not that person at that dinner party? <laughs> that says that thing. Yes. Um, make a specific and concerted effort to consume media that has people who don't look like you. I think one of the best entertainment shows that's on television right now and has been for the past five years is the show Blackish. That show has taken, has picked up where the Cosby show left off several decades ago and they are having the national conversation. They had a show about Ferguson. They had a show about racism within the black community for people of different skin color, different shades of black skin. They had a show about, because they're an upper middle class family, they had a show about the kids in the family going to a poor black neighborhood and being scared because they were in a black neighborhood. You name the thing, they have tackled it and they tackle it with sensitivity and humor. And if you are, if you don't look like the people on that show and you're not watching that show, you need to fire up the ABC app and start from the beginning. There's a, a, a Atlanta. There's lots of other shows about uh, experiences of people of other cultures. These things now, because of Netflix and Hulu and so forth, are starting to pop up. And I, I truly believe that one of the, the fastest cultural changes we saw in the United States of America was from 2004 when Massachusetts passed gay marriage to 2015 when it was legal in all 50 states. What happened? Well, first of all, the millennial generation are the Will and Grace generation. They're the Ellen generation. They grew up seeing people coming into their living room every week who were just people who happened to be born gay. And it was a realization for a lot of us that we have people in our own families, that we have people in our extended families who are gay. I, at the time, was dating someone from Birmingham, Alabama, whose brother came out. Now, he grew up a very conservative Christian, and when his brother came out, he was like, yeah, I think I kind of saw that coming. <laughs> and so then he had to think, well, why would I vote for someone who wants a constitutional amendment against gay marriage? Because that's what was going on in 2004. And yet by 2015, it was legal. And I have this theory, and I don't know if this is right, maybe this is my own dream. So my mother was mixed race, and very quickly, I didn't know until after she died. I didn't know about the black side of her family until after she died. Story for another time. But I truly believe what's going to happen between now and 2054 is we are going to become so mixed that it's almost going to be like the gay person in our family. It's like, well, I, I my black cousin. And so I can't discriminate against you because now that may be my own dream. I can't prove that. I'm not a dem I, I'm not a, a demographer. But by 2000, whatever that word is. But as you see, as the statistics that I left on the page, by 2054, there's going to be no majority. 
There's going to be everybody that we consider to be an ethnic minority right now and whites. And so I, I hope I'm still alive by then to see it. Um, but that's what you, what, listen to podcasts, read books, read White Fragility, read Biased, read Tanahashi Coates, know what's, what the fears are of your, of your uh, brothers and sisters who are trans and, and black and brown. That's what you can actively do. And the more you do that, the more you instinctively get better at your jobs, and I know you're all good at your jobs, but the more you instinctively get better at it, and the less likely you are to be the one who says that thing at the party, as opposed to the one who quietly challenges the person who says that thing. Can I just add one quick thing on that? Sure. As real estate professionals, you all are influencers. You influence not only um, someone's buying decision, but you study your area. You study the schools, you study the policing, you study the businesses, you study where investments are being made, where they're not being made in your area. So you gotta know that social, economic, and community fabric for your area that you that you are selling in, right? Right? If you want to be successful with that. And so what I would just say to you as a as a business leader is that um, you know, be well rounded. You know, I grew up in an inner city area. When I went to college, it was a it was I got dropped into small town USA, ten thousand people, predominantly white college. But that was the best, it, it was a hard experience, but it was the best experience. And I came from, my mother, she never made over $30,000 in her life. When I went to college, she made $17,000 in 1988. So I know I'm blessed, and I make far more than that. So I'm sure most of you can imagine that. And so what I'm saying to you is that you all are influencers. And, and so what you say is important not just to your consumer, uh, but to their families, to the communities. And so as the America continues to change, this is not my grandmother who died in 1999. This is not her America. This is not even my great grandparents' America. It's a different America and it's changing every day. And so for you to be competitive and for your kids and grandkids to be competitive, the difference that we have is we can learn a lot on our phones. We don't have to go to the library. Our phones are not, and our computers are not our library. So to be competitive, we've got to do that research. We have the ability to shut things down, tell people um, that that's not appropriate. I'm not part of that conversation. Don't talk to me about that. Because I get it. You know, whether it's in black groups, white groups, or whatever. You know, you gotta know how to shut that down and tell them, you know what, I'm not part of that. You know, I voted for gay marriage when, in 2010, when this was four years, uh, two years before Obama said it was acceptable, in 2012, right? Right before he got elected, and the second time. And I took a beating. Pastors, my, even my wife at that time, I'm not married anymore. And, uh, <laughs> I took, um, she looked at me in the bed one night and asked me, was I gay? Because I thought it was a gay marriage. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. And so, but you know, it was the right thing, you know, and I did the right thing. I voted, I sponsored a bill on gender identity um, in 2004 to allow people to have um, who work for the city of Buffalo to not be discriminated in their employment. And I represent a district that was 92% black on the city council. And black people in gay marriage is still a work in progress. <laughs> and homosexuality, even in our churches. We can have black folks in the choir and, and pastors still preaching about anti-homosexuality. But I did that and I fought for it and because it was the right thing to do. No, no one's saying that you gotta be on the front line, but when you're on the sideline and that conversation comes up, all you need to do is be that leader and say, that's not, I don't think that's appropriate. You ain't gotta make a big fanfare.
just shut it down. I say, I don't think that's appropriate. And I don't necessarily agree with that. And that's what responsible business leadership is about. Because you may have a kid one day, you may have a great grandkid one day, and you will feel totally different if that happened to them. And it could be you, as this young lady talked about, when she went to buy a house. She's assuming that that's one of the reasons why they did it. But we don't know all the person who's sitting at that table making that real estate agent and that lender who made that decision. And then eight years, she had to wait eight years. She had to rent for eight more years. Think about the economic windfall that that rent that landlord made at her expense as she waited eight years. And that's what we're talking about today is how do we level that playing field? Because why should someone pay all their other bills on time, but we base the credit modeling system on stuff that excludes them, right? And you know, some people are making, there are 1.8 million black millennials right now that are credit worthy, many of them making over $100,000 a year that are not buying houses, and that's a market that we all need. I don't care what color, because the, at the end of the day, it's not about the color of your skin, it's about the green that you put in the bank. Agreed. Have a round of applause for all of us speakers. We have our gift card raffle to Prime 82. Red ticket. <laughs>